You probably hear the term algorithms a couple of times a week. YouTubers especially like to praise or blame the algorithm for their success or failure. In this video, I want to go a little bit more in depth and explain what an algorithm is and what it can do for you. From a very abstract point of view, an algorithm is a well-defined computational procedure that describes the necessary steps to create an output for a given input and establish an input-output relation. However, this description doesn't bring us very far. Take for example a recipe for a pie. Such a recipe firstly states the ingredients needed to make a pie. This usually includes flour, butter, eggs and sugar. After you get all the ingredients, the recipe describes all the steps necessary to put everything together to get a pie. The list of ingredients can be seen as the input and the pie as the output of an algorithm. That describes how to make a pie. However, recipes often leave a lot of room for interpretation and sometimes don't detail enough to get the same result as the recipe creator. A proper algorithm gives you exact instructions on how to turn a given input into an output. Those instructions can be written down in natural language such as English, obviously program code or even hardware. As natural language often takes too many words to describe something precisely and program code of a programming language such as Python can be too implementation specific, algorithms are often written down in pseudocode which can be seen as a mix of natural language, mathematic notation and program code. Pseudocode for an algorithm that calculates the factorial of a given number could look like this. First, the input is stated, in this case a single integer number n. Secondly, the input constraints are listed, which are necessary to ensure the algorithm works correctly. Afterwards comes the pseudocode. It starts off with the name of the algorithm, here factorial. Then the first statement, where 1 is assigned to x. Next up comes a loop that loops from 1 to n, and inside that loop, x is assigned x multiplied by the current loop counter i. And lastly, the result is returned. Pseudocode allows you to only capture the essence of a given algorithm without thinking about implementation details and shows you input limitations using constraints. This brings us to the correctness of an algorithm. An algorithm is correct if and only if the algorithm halts and produces the correct output for every possible input. An incorrect algorithm can have devastating consequences when deployed in an environment that could harm people. However, showing the correctness of an algorithm is not trivial and it is its own field in computer science. And if you want to see a correctness proof, let me know down below in the comments. So an algorithm is an accurate description for turning an input into an output in the stair for a tool that helps you to solve computational problems, for which I am going to give you some examples now. The most prominently and widely used algorithms are sorting algorithms. A sorting algorithm rearranges a list of input data according to a comparison criterion. Such a criterion could be the value of a number or the length of a string. During the process of sorting, the input data elements are compared to each other with the comparison criterion. However, how many elements are compared to each other is up to the algorithm designer and will have the most significant impact on the runtime of the sorting algorithm. Sorting can be found almost everywhere. For example, in a database of addresses where you need to find the email address of a friend. You could go through all the entries and check for the person you are looking for, but that can become very tiring. Due to this, the addresses are first sorted by the database for you, so you can scroll down to your friend's name just by following the alphabet. Another example where sorting algorithms come in handy is finding the maximum element of a list and determining if it is unique. When the list isn't sorted, every element has to be checked. Firstly, if it is the maximum element, and secondly, if this element appears more than once. The maximum elements in the sorted list are either at the beginning or the end of a list, depending on the comparison criterion. You can quickly retrieve the maximum element and check if it is unique by checking its neighboring elements and if they have the same value. Another important class of algorithms is routing algorithms. A routing algorithm allows you to find the shortest path between two points. Without such algorithms, delivery drivers would have to guess every time how to reach your address to deliver a parcel. Not only do delivery drivers rely on routing algorithms, also the video data you retrieve from this YouTube video has to find a path from the server to you. The whole internet is built up on routing algorithms to send data from one computer to another in a fraction of a second. Hence the name router because it is responsible for routing data chunks from one network to another. While talking about data traveling through routers on the internet, this data has to be encrypted such that your personal information stays private. For encrypting and decrypting data, 
cryptography algorithms are used that are designed in a way that the only the true receiver is able to decrypt the data and is able to verify that the data was actually sent by the true sender. Those algorithms belong to the public key and signature algorithms. Many business decisions depend on making the best decision for purchase or investment. For example, a fast food chain wants to open up a new restaurant in a large city and there are multiple different spots at which they can rent out a new building. However, finding the best one involves numerous factors such as the demographics in the building's neighborhood, rent, accessibility by cars, pedestrians or delivery vehicles and the competitors in the area. Usually an algorithm from the linear programming category is chosen to solve such a problem. For most of the problems I just introduced, a naive solution can be found pretty effortlessly, which usually is a brute force approach where every possible combination is tried out. However, when you deal with more data than just a handful of elements, those algorithms will take a very, very long time to produce an output. An algorithm can be divided into basic operations or steps, which can be summed up to get an implementation independent runtime evaluation. For example, the factorial algorithm we have just seen earlier can be split into the following basic operations. First, x is assigned to one. Then the for loop condition is checked. Inside the for loop, x is multiplied by i and assigned to x. And in the end of the for loop, i is increased by 1. And lastly, x is returned. Every operation outside of the loop is only executed once when the algorithm runs, which is the first and the last statement, which makes 2. The three operations inside the loop are executed n times because that is how often the loop iterates. When we put everything together, we get 2 plus 3 n operations that have to be executed for factorial depending on the input n. This can be seen as an implementation independent runtime. And there is even a more abstract way to describe the runtime of an algorithm that makes the runtime differences between algorithms more comparable, which is called the big O notation that I'm going to cover in a later video. So make sure you get subscribed so you don't miss it. When talking about the runtime of an algorithm, it is equally important to talk about the data structures an algorithm uses to organize the data it deals with. Take for example, the Python list and the Python dictionary. Both data structures allow you to store data in an ordered manner. However, retrieving an element from those data structures can result in vastly different runtimes when you want to get an element from that list that fulfills a certain property. In a list, you have to check every element in the list in the worst case to find the desired element. But if you construct a dictionary where the key is the element property you're interested in and the value is the element itself, you can retrieve the element with a single access and save a lot of time. For some computational problems, there are only solutions known that have to try out every possibility to find the correct or optimal solution in the worst case. This class of algorithms is called NP-complete. While verifying that the correct solution was found can be done in polynomial time, meaning that you only need n to the power of x basic operations to perform the check, finding the solution employs a brute force search which takes exponential time, meaning that n is in the exponent and not in the base. A fascinating property of NP-complete algorithms is that if someone finds a solution for one NP-complete algorithm that runs faster than exponential time, this can be transferred over to every other NP-complete algorithm. This is also known as P versus NP and is one of the millennium problems. And when you solve one of those problems, you will be awarded a price of 1 million US dollars. NP-complete problems are quite common. One of the most famous examples is the traveling salesman problem. Imagine a salesman that wants to visit different customers living in different cities. Now the question is, what is the optimal path to visit every customer while traveling the shortest distance and thereby the least amount of time? There are intelligent solving strategies for NP-complete problems that find a solution in a reasonable amount of time while keeping the amount of input data small. And you should use those when coming across such a problem. To sum everything up, Algorithms are a crucial part of computer science and knowing about their runtime and use cases makes you a great computer scientist and programmer because that enables you to solve complex computational problems efficiently. The more you work with algorithms and data structures, the more you see problems that could be solved because algorithms are everywhere in our daily lives. And if you enjoyed watching this video and want to keep on watching, check out this video over here.